Hello and welcome to the Atoll, your home for Waterworld fandom. In today's special video, we'll be kicking off a four-part series of the Waterworld novelization audiobook. I recently covered this rare collectible in my video looking at all the versions of the Waterworld novels and how they compare to each other and the actual film, so be sure to check out that deep dive if you haven't already. This audiobook, published by Cinema Sounds in 1995, is a slightly abridged version of the full Max Allen Collins novel. Amazingly, the vocal talent reading the novel is none other than R.D. Call, the actor that played the Atoll Enforcer in the film. This is a very special piece of Waterworld media that I am proud to present to you today. And just a note here before we get started, the Waterworld novel and audiobook contain some problematic material concerning racial stereotypes and the abuse towards women and children. And in no way does this YouTube channel align itself with any of these harmful conventions, and I present this material as is, purely an artifact of its time that we can now look back on with a more critical lens. So without further ado, I give you part one of the Waterworld audiobook. Soundlines Entertainment presents a Cinema Sounds audio production of Waterworld, a novel by Max Allen Collins, based on the screenplay written by Mark Norman, and story by Peter Rader, performed by R.D. Call. They say before the polar ice caps melted, people dwelled in neither atolls nor villages, but in land-based cities, living and working in towering structures called buildings some of which stretched higher than a dozen windmills. Not all customs then would be foreign to us now. Families did live together in single dwellings. But the most modest of these would put our huts to shame. These lavish abodes of wood and or brick could be found in the cities. Yes, but also here and there along rolling green countryside where both animals and plant life were raised on farms to create food to nourish a population that spread across oceans of land. Ribbons of rock ran through the land oceans, connecting city and country, and land boats roamed these solid streams at will, with go juice as plentiful as water. There were even deserts, vast stretches of ground so dry, so bereft of water, that only spiny plants and spiny critters could grow. This was land that people avoided, in those days, solid ground was not the exception, but the rule for the feet of men, women, and children, too. When was this? Well, it was before the world was thought to be covered with water. But this tale, my children, is not of those ancient times, but of more recent times, the past I can remember firsthand. And once upon a time when I was a child, I encountered the legendary figure whom some of you revere as the Mariner. But when I knew the Mariner, at least when I first met him, he didn't really have a name. Perhaps that's why death could not find him, and he didn't have a home or people to care for. Having no one made him strong. He was not afraid of anything or anyone, and he could hear for a hundred miles underwater. He could hide in the shadow of a noon sun, and he could be standing behind you and you wouldn't even know it, not till right before he killed you. Don't be frightened. He was a hero. He was the bravest man in Waterworld, and he wasn't even a man at all. The water gliding under the bows of the trimaran was more amethyst than blue. As the three-hulled ragtaggle ship with its single egg-beater sail carved a trio of parallel paths in the smoothness of an endless ocean. The glassy sea was so gently rippled you could forget the dangers beneath. Of course, there were dangers above as well. Some sharks were, after all, human. But the mariner was well equipped to deal with both. The gentle wind was perfect trawling weather. His ship, towing a dragline cable, was a cobbled-together collection of aluminum, plastic, fiberglass, 
the fossils of an earlier time welded and stitched and glued and hammered together into a forty-foot, oddly fitted craft that was as weathered as its captain, and like him, unnamed. Its three hulls were interconnected with a netting that became a single deck for the ship, and made child's play of maneuvering from one hull to the other. And yet for all this both captain and craft were oddly sleek. He lived on his nameless ship. His clay-potted lime plant was the only other life form. Wind chimes fashioned from ancient computer boards and printed circuits tinkled and sang a melancholy, tuneless tune. A prow-mounted harmonica played its own ghostly, non-melody. And cockpit control shifted idly with the current. Clothing of his washed in the salt water twisted on a line in a breeze. A patchwork sunshade, an easily rocking hammock, a blood-crusted harpoon gun. These were the company he kept. A yellow stained glass beaker at his feet was no challenge for an aim long since perfected. His urine arced and it splashed into the glass was as gentle as that of the lazy waves his ship cut through. Soon he rebuttoned his pants, cut off jeans, much older than he, and plucked the beaker of precious yellow fluid from the deck and proceeded to his homemade water recycling system. He poured the piss into the plastic funnel that began the process and stood tapping his foot while the liquid made its passage through the globes and filters and hoses and valves of a contraption whose design had been sold to him at an atoll by a wizened old trader who claimed the original inventor had been a very great scientist in the land days named Rube Goldberg. By the time the liquid finished its journey and puddled back into the original beaker, the urine jello cast was but a pale memory. He held the beaker to his lips, threw back his head, and returned the liquid to his body. Weathered with wiry muscularity, the mariner, wearing nothing but those cut-offs, a sheathed knife, and a shell earring, had features of a sort that in another time might have been considered handsome. But his eyes were slits under a brow furrowed with constant watch and the face was hard and grooved and mostly obscured in a snarl of facial hair that at times mingled with the shoulder-length, sun-brightened brown mane that brushed his shoulders and concealed his secret. A sudden creaking lurch of the ship sent him racing to the stern where he could see the dragline. He plucked a zippered rubber salvage pouch from the deck. He would have to swim down and transfer its contents of his trawl net into the salvage bag, he took a few moments to gather deep, hyperventilating breaths, standing on feet whose toes were webbed, flexing the gills behind his ears beneath the flowing mane. Then he dove over the side and was swallowed by a welcoming sea. Just as the salvage bag popped up on the surface near the trimaran, the mariner's head bobbed up. The bag was brimming with booty. The silver discs labeled Compact Disc Digital Audio. What had these been for, he wondered. A knobless square red plastic chunk with a gray screen. This was labeled Etch-a-Sketch. Some empty glass bottles, some plastic bottles, too. A good haul. He pulled himself up onto the deck, depositing a few of the choicer items onto the deck of the central hull. A bent ski pole, a broken ski, a discolored pair of ski boots joined by their laces. The rest of his bounty remained in the floating bag. He'd have to tug that up on deck, too, or before long it would drift out of reach. But he allowed himself a moment to focus on one tiny precious item. A bick, it was labeled. But the mariner had heard them called lighters. He flicked it. A flame erupted from the bick's tip, and a smile erupted on the mariner's leathery face. Now wasn't this a prize? His attention snapped back at the creak of a boat. He flew to the harpoon gun mounted on the bow and swung it toward the sound. The patched together clumsy looking sloop must have glided up while he was below the surface. Had its one man captain and crew, an Asian drifter, taken the opportunity of the mariner's absence to board the ship for some quick looting? The Asian froze in the sights of the harpoon gun. Cautiously, he raised his arms. I didn't board you, the Asian said in Hindu. I wouldn't do such a thing. The mariner kept his gun trained on the drifter. You were down there a long time, the Asian said. 
thought maybe something happened to you. Or were you hoping? The mariner replied in the same tongue. No, English, the Asian said, switching to a heavily accented English. I wish bad luck on no man, except maybe smokers. Smokers were the worst breed of pirate in Waterworld. Barbarians in the sway of a vicious madman called the Deacon. That depends on whether you consider smokers men. More like beasts, the Asian said. But tell me, how does a man stay underwater so long a time? Hull's busted, the mariner said. Hull's so big there's room to stick your head up and breathe. Bad luck. But you know the slavers are producing a good trade epoxy these days, the Asian said. The salvage bag of booty was floating past the sloop. The mariner said, but it would cost dearly. A handful of dirt, or maybe that wind chime, or breeder, if you're the kind of man who deals in flesh. The mariner watched his booty bag sail away, caught by the current. What do you deal in? This and that. What were you doing alongside my boat? The Asian's grin returned. Just that, waiting? For me? For you not to come up? Then I would have boarded your ship. The booty bag was still in sight. If his guest would only leave, the mariner could retrieve it. But he revealed no anxiety as he said, Your boat looks familiar. I've seen it before, but not you. The Asian shrugged. Its previous owner didn't need it no more. Why is that? He was dead, English. Took it illegal, salvage rights. The Asian nodded toward the trimaran. You had another hour. Before you traded up again? That's right, just improving my means. At least you waited, I owe you that much. No, no, you owe me nothing, English. I got all the supplies I need. See, I just come from an atoll. Eight days due east, if you're interested. Two of our kind meet, something's got to be exchanged, the mariner said. I know the code as well as you, English. Tell you what, give you this one for free. Something else out there on the horizon. Nothing's free in Waterworld, the mariner said. Two puffs of smoke curled from two distant dots on the water, but across the water came a sound that seemed much closer. Engines. Smokers, the Asian whispered, eyes wide with fear. Just enough wind to get away clean. Luck to you, the mariner said. And to you, the Asian said, adjusting his sail. The mariner was looking at his floating salvage bag. And now the Asian paused long enough to spot it as well. It's not worth it, English, he called, shaking his head so violently his body shook. And two small, almost round green objects tumbled out of his ragged shirt onto the sloop's deck. The mariner flashed a look at his lime tree and saw it had been stripped of its valuable fruit. But the sloop was on its way now, and the raggedy captain was flashing a grin. See? You paid me after all, English, he called. Turning to his steering console, the mariner knew levers that converted the ship into something quite unexpected. The egg beater sail folded into the mast, which extended to twice its height. A boom appeared from out of the center hull's deck. Sails unfurled as the trawler almost magically transformed itself into a sleek racing yacht. Yanking tiller and lines, the mariner headed straight for the booty bag. Others were bearing down on the booty bag, too. Those dots on the horizon had blossomed into a horrible quartet. The four barely-dressed brutes, as fierce as they were stupid, rode Goju's burning water sleds, known in ancient times as jet skis. The mariner knew how savage these dim-witted, muscle-bound marauders were. Being smarter wasn't enough. You'd have to be faster, too. The trimaran was flying at forty knots when the ship rounded the salvage bag. A long gaff pole in hand, he snagged the bag even as the ship was coming about hard. Then the trimaran was going in the opposite direction, and the four pirates on jet skis almost tumbled off their perches, bringing their little craft around to take pursuit. Up ahead, he could see the Asian drifter's sloop. He charted a collision course and was damn near on top of the drifter before the half-dozing man, a half-eaten lime in one lazy hand, realized those crystal-clear engine sounds weren't coming to him across the water. 
but were perilously close. The Asian tossed the lime like it had suddenly turned red hot and tried desperately to trim his sails, but the mariner's trimaran was closing on him. And the smokers were ripping across the water, zeroing in on the mariner's stern. The Asian let out a pitiful yelp as the trimaran suddenly sheeted in on one side, drenching the sloop's deck and its captain, and the smaller boat's mainmast cracked in two. Looking back at the crestfallen captain of the now floundering sloop, the mariner raised a scolding finger. You don't break the code. It was a lesson the drifter was unlikely to live to profit from. The smokers had abandoned their pursuit of him in favor of swooping in on this easier, wounded prey. The atolls of Waterworld were skeletal, shaped by man, not nature, from the skeletal remains of that earlier industrial time, in the land days. A week and a day after his encounter with the drifter and the four smokers, his trimaran converted to trawler mode, approaching the sprawling atoll. The walled circular city with its occasional jutting guard towers and central lagoon rose from the hulls of derelict boats, haphazardly constructed from scraps of metal, wood, plastic, and canvas. As he neared the massive twin gates with its pair of skeletal wood and steel canvas canopied guard towers, the mariner could see a desiccated, near-naked man in a one-man bowl of a boat, bobbing in front of the dam-like gates of the water city. The pitiful wretch was trying desperately to bargain his way inside. Go on, beat it! A bearded gatesman shouted down nastily. The trimaran glided into the concave area before the imposing twin gates. The mariner hoisted the green flag of the traitor, whose booty was laid out for inspection on the prow. Hubcaps, a yo-yo, a broken object called a clarinet, apparently a musical instrument. The silver disc labeled CDs and more of the ancient trash that had become modern treasure. The mariner had made himself presentable. In his armless leather and canvas jacket, fish-skin pants and ski boots he had salvaged last week. Slinging a leather pouch on a strap, he stepped forward on his netting deck and looked up at the bearded gatesman. The enforcer stood nearby. Vested in typical atoll patchwork leather and canvas, this massive creature needed no uniform for the mariner to know who he was. Every atoll had a guardian at the gate. An enforcer. The mariner said, Quell Lang! The enforcer said, I'd say yours is English, drifter. The mariner nodded. English it is, then, the enforcer said. Afraid the flag's down, drifter. We got enough traitors in Oasis. The mariner lifted the strap, pulling up the pouch, and removed the lid from the heavy jar within. He dipped a hand into the jar, scooping up a handful of priceless substance therein, and allowed it to trickle through his fingers back into its container. Dirt, the gatesman sighed. The mariner smiled, just a little. Open the gates for him, the enforcer muttered. The four canvas-covered blades of a windmill churned the air lazily. The windmill was the electricity source of this floating village, and was its highest, most dominant structure. Even in the trawling mode, the mariner's ship Easy Glide and sleek design caught the eyes of the atollers. Solemn, sullen people, their patchwork clothing running consistently to dreary grays and browns. Moving along walkways from one lashed-together boat or barge to another, the atollers wandered. Few seemed to be working at anything much. There were no greetings from these water city citizens. Merely stares. The mariner coldly returned their stares. He gave no sign of noticing. But the mariner was well aware that the brawny enforcer had been shadowing along behind him. That was to be expected. The law always kept an eye on strangers. Before long, the trimaran slipped alongside a sprawling, multi-tiered outhouse-dotted organo barge, a pungent fixture in any atoll. Part compost heap, part fruit garden, part cemetery. Under a tree, a handful of the grieving and a clutch of church elders in bizarre seaweed gowns and caps of dried jellyfish surrounded the corpse of an elderly woman. A somber voice rang across the water as one of the elders, a cadaverous individual with an imperious bearing, spoke. 
Bones to berries, veins to vines, these tendons to trees, this blood to brine. The old woman's body began to sink as the mourners revealed garden hose and began tending rows of fruit and vegetables around her. Then, without so much as a burp from the compost heap, she was gone. Body recycled and enshrined, the elder's voice rose grandly. In the presence of him who leads us. Right, the mariner said, and guided his craft toward a grillwork dock. He was securing his ship when a menacing shadow fell across him. And the mariner looked up. Remember me? The enforcer said casually. The mariner stood his ground. I know who you are. What you are. Good. You got two hours, the enforcer said. I only need one. Less is your choice. More is an infraction. Understand? The mariner nodded. The enforcer stood watching as the mariner yanked from the deck a canvas bag of salvaged treasures. He opened this and plucked out a diagonal rearview mirror from an ancient Goju's landboat. He started down the dock and stopped one of two tattered boys. What do you got there, mister? One boy asked. Something you can see yourself in that isn't water. Wow, the boy said. His friend crowded around the shiny object, and the two dirty faces looked back at their owners. Crabs of hell, the other boy said. The mariner slapped him on top of the head, not hard. Don't curse. It's not civilized. This is called a mirror, and it's yours. Which one of us, the first boy said. It's for both of you. You know how to share, don't you? Sure, the second boy said. Well, it's yours, the mariner said. If everything's here when I get back. The boys nodded their assurances as he tucked the mirror back in his canvas bag. The trading barge was nearby, and as he made his way there, a Pied Piper's trail of atollers followed behind him. The trading post was part tavern, part store. There were tables where men traded and others where they ate and or drank. One counter served as a bar for the dispensing of various grades of hydro. Another, off to one side, served as a sort of bank. It was at the latter that the mariner conducted his business. The dirt from the jar poured out on a scale was weighed precisely, handled with a delicacy deserving of so precious a commodity. 7.9 kilos, the banker whispered. A crowd of atollers gathered to watch the transaction. How'd you come by so much of it? The banker asked. The mariner shrugged. Another atoll. Which one? Thirty horizons west. Hmm, the banker said. Where'd they get it? Didn't say. From the crowd, a scrawny male atoller called. I heard about that place. Smokers raided them. Another atoll called out in agreement. Yeah, they were all killed. That's why they didn't say, the mariner said. The banker narrowed his eyes. Was it smokers killed them? Don't know, the mariner said. Could have been slavers. So what's it worth to you? He pointed at the pile of dirt. Are we talking or trading? The banker cocked his head. Uh, that work out to 62 chits. That goes a long way here in Oasis. Twice that goes farther, the mariner said. And that's what I want. And that's what he got. At the rear of the trading post, the tavern area was tended by its owner, a strikingly beautiful woman called Helen. Many in Oasis, as in any atoll in water world, had long since lost all hope desperately clinging to what Helen well knew was a dying civilization. What kept her going? What set her apart? Her belief in the ancient myth of a place called Dryland. Only to Helen, Dryland was no myth. That belief, and the very special orphan child she had been raising, gave her courage to believe in a better tomorrow. Right now she was serving a pair of scruffy traders. What's so great about dirt? The younger was asking. 
You can't eat it, his companion was saying. You can eat the fruit or vegetables that grow from it, she offered. True enough, the young trader said, but the amount you can find won't grow you much of anything. To make his point, he gestured to a scrawny tomato plant in a pot on one of the nearly bare shelves of the store area back of the bar that Helen also owned and tended. Can you afford that plan? she asked him. Well, that's not the point. The stuff is highly overvalued, if you ask me. Go shit, the older companion said. You'd kill for the stuff, same as me. It isn't what you can do with the dirt, Helen said. It's what it stands for. There's a promise it holds. Promise? the younger trader asked. Yes, she said. And the question the dirt asks, Where did I come from? Dry land, the older trader said, his voice almost holy. A jug, a harsh voice said. Helen looked up into the cold blue eyes of a muscular, shark-eyed garb trader with shoulder-length blonde hair and features that would have been handsome had they not been tinged with cruelty. Under the tan, the flesh was fair. He was a Nord. Great, too, the Nord said. She fetched the netted jug but left her hand on its neck, saying, Three chits. He dug out the coins, gave her a lecherous smile, and grabbed the jug going over to a table where a tattered wreck of a hydroholic was waiting. What was a thriving trader doing consorting with a beggar like that, she wondered. As she scrubbed the bar with a rag, the two men began to talk. Helen could not hear their conversation. The Nord poured a murky tumbler of hydro. But when the old hydroholic reached for the glass, the Nord gripped the man's bony wrist, hard. That wasn't the deal, the Nord said. First, you tell me. It's the child, the old man whispered. What child? That woman, the old man pointed. The Nord looked toward Helen. Are we talking about a woman or a child? Both. What about them? It's her child, you see. Well, it's not her child. Crabs of hell, I can't think I, I can't talk, not without a drink. The old man reached for the glass again, and the Nord wrist-locked him even harder this time. First, info, the Nord said, then hydro. She's raising a child. The child ain't her as she's from somewhere else. Another atoll, you mean? No. That's just it. The old man's eyes glittered. Dry land. The Nord snorted. <laughs> Dry land's a fairy tale. Maybe. But this child, she's got marks, tattoos, inkings. On her back, I've, I've seen them. Some slavers mark their women that way, the Nord said. The old man leaned closer. But these aren't slaver markings. It's a map. Lead you all the way to dry land. The Nord let out another derisive snort. <sighs> that again. You talk dry rot, old man. But the old man was staring at him intensely. There are some around who still believe. I heard... But I ain't going to tell you what I heard. Not if you're going to be so stingy with that hydro. I can be generous. Try me. The old hydroholic leaned closer. Well, I heard some traders say that certain people got an eye out for the child. They've been looking for her. What certain people? You know, smokers. Smokers, is it? The old man nodded gravely. The Nord smiled. Well, we wouldn't want to cross them, would we? Best keep all this to ourselves. And he pushed the glass of hydro toward the old man. I say you are a generous and kind man, sir. The old man began greedily gulping down the fluid, even as another trader was walking up to the bar. The trader with a shell earring who had caused such a stir with his high-quality, pure-grade dirt. Help you? Helen asked him. Yeah. You run the tavern, right? Right. Maybe you could direct me to the store. She knew how pitifully bare the walls behind her were. 
wood and metal shelving, mostly barren. The netted hanging baskets empty. Afraid you're looking at it, she said. Crabs of hell, he said. You don't have much to offer. <laughs> Speak for yourself, drifter. Another trader laughed. Can I get you something to drink? She asked. How much hydro you got in storage? Six G's. I'll take all of it. You'll close me down. You in business to sell it? Yes, but, well, I'll buy it. Okay. Got any canvas? Any line? We got line, she said. But it's hair, no canvas. Any bread? No. Wood. Just the shells on the wall. His eyes flared. How about magazines? If I had magazines, she said, they'd be sold long ago, and I'd be retired. Magazines were the one thing more valuable than dirt in Waterworld. Actual pictures of land days. What could be more precious? The stranger slumped, disappointed that his chits could buy so little. How about that drink? I still got a few bottles you didn't buy. Make it a tall one, the good stuff. He threw a chit on the counter. She was pouring him a tumbler of clear water when the Nord sidled up to the bar, next to the stranger. Skoll, the Nord said to the mariner. Quanto tiempo vous parti? The mariner ignored this intrusion. He raised the glass of hydro to his nose, savored its bouquet. Then he took a small, slow sip. No habla vous polyglot, huh? The Nord was saying. The mariner downed his glass. How about English, then? The Nord asked. The mariner lifted his empty glass and said to Helen, One more. The Nord touched her wrist. Make it two, sweet one. A man this rich will buy a glass out of courtesy for a fellow outwater, I'm sure. She pulled her wrist away. Just one, the mariner said quietly. The Nord stared at the mariner with blank menace that slowly blossomed into a smile. So, dirt man, the Nord said, how long you been out? The mariner sipped a second tumbler of hydro. What lunar is it? Saugust. So how long you been out between atolls? Fifteen lunars. This rocked the Nord. Fifteen lunars? Don't you like people? The Nord laughed incredulously, then something caught his attention as his expression froze. A child was coming from behind the tarp of the storeroom behind the counter. She couldn't have been older than seven. Her skin was darker than that of the lady bartender. The woman was not likely the child's mother, though both were handsome enough. Her netting apparel was similar to the woman's, but the child's midriff was bare. This, and the dreadlocked hair, gave her a look apart from the other atollers on Oasis. The girl moved to a stove and dug inside, fishing out bits of charcoal. As she bent over the stove, the back of her netting tunic slipped down, revealing something. What? Those are tattoos, the mariner thought. A dark circle, a jagged peak an arrow, and lettering within and around the circle that looked oriental. The mariner was not the only one who noted this. The Nord had moved so close to the counter he was damn near climbing over it. Helen saw this. Enola, she called to the girl. I want to draw some more, the child said. Helen knelt and guided the girl to her feet. Come on, baby. But I need more, Enola said. I'll bring it to you, Helen said. You just stay in back now. Only grown-ups out here. You know the rules. With a loving pat, Helen guided her to the back room and lowered the tarp. When she returned, she caught the Nord nodding to the old hydroholic who was nodding back. What did it mean? Had they seen the markings? Could they know their significance? There was nothing to worry about, she told herself, but the back of her neck was tingling. So, the Nord said, as I was saying, if you don't like paper, why would you think these atollers would give a shit about... The mariner stopped him with a look. Why are you talking to me? Just being friendly. I don't have friends, the mariner said. 
The Nord thought about that, then shrugged and wandered away from the counter and out of the trading post. You ready for another? Helen asked the mariner. This'll hold me. He looked toward the mostly barren shelves. That plant. How much? The dirt it's in goes with it, you know. I know. And the pot. She thought a moment, then said, Half your chits. He nodded without hesitation. What the hell else was there to buy? She was plucking the plant off the shelf when he added, I'll take them, too. Take what? You bought everything but the shelves. That's what I mean, he said. I'll take them, too. The mariner stepped from the trading post into the afternoon sunshine, heading for his trimaran. Can I have the reflector now, mister? said one of the boys he had left to watch the trimaran. Not till I check my boat. You got people waiting to see you. Give it to me here now, would you please? Why? In case you're in trouble. The mariner stopped. Who is it that's waiting for me? Committee of Elders, the big shots there, Priam, they call him. Okay, he said and handed over the mirror. But remember to share it with your pal. Yes, mister. The boy scurried off and the mariner wondered if he had been scammed. As he approached his trimaran, the cadaverous one who had officiated at the funeral stepped forward. A proposition for you, sir, Priam said. I've finished my trading here. He tried to move past Priam, but the group blocked the walkway. But you haven't heard our proposition yet. Or rather, seen it. The group of elders parted to reveal a girl. She couldn't have been far out of her teens, if at all. She wore filmy netting apparel that didn't conceal her well-rounded attributes. And her face was pleasant, if frightened. What do you think? Hmm? The elder asked. I think you boys run an interesting religion around here. But she's agreeable enough, isn't she? Priam pressed. And they say you've been out fifteen lunars. Just out of curiosity, what do I have to do to earn this fee? Priam frowned. Oh, you don't understand. She is what we're asking you to do. What? Another elder stepped forward. You may have noticed us bearing a citizen today. You understand we maintain strict population control here. Yes, so? So, Priam said, one citizen's death makes room for one more. Well, I'm not staying. We're not asking you to. All we want is your seed. The mariner glanced at the girl. Now he understood. We could look to our own for impregnation, another elder said, but too much of that gets undesirable. That's why we outlawed it. Once she's with child, another elder said, you can go along about your way with all the supplies you need. You don't have anything I need, the mariner said. This place is dying. I want no part of it. The mariner pushed past them. As he approached his ship, he could hear the elders muttering behind him. Maybe he's a smoker spy. Is he hiding something? The elders were staring after him with expressions that ranged from fear to suspicion, and a crowd of atollers was gathering on the wharf nearby. Crabs of hell. The trimaran was just up ahead as a hard hand grabbed his shoulder from behind. The bearded gatesman said, When the elders give the word, you can leave. Not before. The mariner swung the shelving into the gatesman and moved quickly on. Then the other gatesman was suddenly there, one hand on a stubby spear gun holstered on his hip, the other grabbing the mariner's arm. The mariner reached out his free arm and squeezed the trigger of the holstered spear gun and sent an arrow streaking down, skewering the guy's foot to the dock. But the mariner's freedom was short-lived. Powerful arms locked him from behind. The first gatesman had gotten up. The mariner sent a sharp backward headbutt to the gatesman's face, unleashing a torrent of blood. Again, freedom was fleeting. A trio of male atollers doing the elder's bidding, group tackled him, dragging him into the dock, fingers clutching his neck in a chokehold. The mariner twisted his neck, fighting the grip, working his mouth around to where he could get at one of those hands, choking him. 
and took a big, deep bite. The guy screamed and released the chokehold, but grabbed with both hands at the mariner's long hair and yanked up, as if trying to rip the mariner's head off. Instead, the seashell earring got torn from the mariner's lobe, and the hair fell away from the neck, revealing the gill behind his ear. Shades below, the atoller said. He's a muto! And he could hear an alarm being raised as the voice of Priam shouted, Mutation! The cry rang through the atoll. He lashed out with a hard fist at the nearest face and began throwing kicks and punches. Don't let him get near to the water, Priam cried. Blocking his way were a clutch of atollers ready to bring him down. So he leaped right over the imbeciles, clearing them only by inches as he splashed into the lagoon. He could swim under the gate and survive out there until some trader gave him a lift. But echoing above the water was a voice. The nets! Cast out the nets! He was a fish for them to catch now. Well, let them try. All around were splashes and spurts of foam as atollers dove in, surrounding him, and a net large enough to snag the trimaran came cascading down. He whirled, hoping to dive deeper than the nets or the atollers could follow, but it was too late. The net was around him, and they were yanking it tight. Soon, men on the dock with their gaffs were pulling him in. Through the grid of the netting, he could see them. Not just a crowd, but a mob now. Angry, frightened faces. Only one sympathetic face could he find. The woman. Helen. But that wasn't worth much when the rest of the mob was screaming, Kill him! Kill him! The net came off as a rope looped him around the neck, around the gills, and yanked tight. The bearded gatesman was his keeper. In a voice deep and funereal, the high elder said, He almost poisoned our strain! The mariner knew a death sentence when he heard one. The swish that saved him was that of a machete slicing through the rope. The mariner fell to his knees, gasping for air. Above him, glaring at the gatesman, was the enforcer. By what right? Priam began, stepping up to the enforcer. The enforcer wasn't impressed by Priam. You pay me to keep the peace. This ain't it. He needs to be destroyed, Priam said. That may be the enforcer said, but not here, and not like this. Cage him, the high elder said. Then they hauled him away, with the ugly muttering mob following along. The enforcer took charge of the mariner's property, the netting bag of shelves and the potted tomato plant. The mariner did not see the one person in the crowd who stayed behind. Helen. Nor did he see her as she scooped up something and concealed it in her tunic. The Mariner's Shell Earring The sprawl of the organo barge was nearby, its pungent waste odors a constant reminder of where the elders of Oasis intended to dispose of him. Battered, bleeding, the Mariner was suspended over the pier in an iron cage, swaying in the cool evening breeze. He could make out a gentle musical sound, lilting laughter echoing melodically across the water. He looked toward the laughter and saw the face it belonged to. In the window of the windmill tower was the child. That dark, pretty, mysterious child from the tavern. What did that tavern wench, Helen, call the girl? Enola. The name was as lovely as her laughter. Soon coils within jars atop poles along the wharf walkway came gradually alive until brightening pools of yellow light glowed here and there. With this light, he could make out his trimaran. Crabs of hell! There were people on his deck. Helpless, he watched as atollers hopped off the trimaran with armloads of his possessions, scurrying away like rats into the night. The mariner's eyes traveled to the lagoon nearby, where a little dinghy was being rowed past him by the grinning Nord. The blonde trader waved as the dinghy eased its way to the main gates, which groaned open just wide enough to give the Nord passage, then rumbled shut. A muffled echoing of voices traveled to him from a converted Chinese junk. Earlier, he had seen the atollers and the elders entering the structure. Perhaps his fate was being decided within even now. You didn't even get invited to your own trial in this damned atoll. In a loft workshop, within the tower of the windmill. 
a white-bearded, slightly stooped old man gazed through one of his own inventions. A makeshift telescope aimed into the heavens. Around him in the workshop were wheezing bellows, the skeletons of fish, various fruit-grafting experiments, bottles, tubes, and flasks. Gregor was his name, and he was the designer of the windmill whose gears powered the atoll's electricity. The elders, all the atollers, in fact, considered him brilliant, a genius. Yet to Gregor, the answer to the most crucial question in Waterworld lay just out of reach, just sitting there. Or to be more precise, it rested on the back of a child. She was forty feet below him, sitting at a table by a window, hunkered over there at her favorite pastime, drawing. Using a piece of charcoal, a draw stick, as the child put it, she drew directly on the table, conjuring up fabulous visions of things no one in Waterworld had ever seen, outside of a few who had seen those precious manuscripts called magazines. Gregor recognized a good number of the images, and knew these fabulous images were glimpses of life on land, plants and waterfalls and birds and beasts. Could these all flow from the child's imagination? As he approached the doodling child, Gregor knew the answer. This was not a child recording her dreams. The charcoal sketches reported things this girl had seen, just as right now she was putting the finishing touches on a crude drawing of a man in a hanging cage. The old man said, Lovely child, lovely. You've drawn our fishman and so very well. Thank you. She returned to her drawing. I don't mean to bother you, child, he said, lifting her long hair and tugging down her tunic ever so slightly to have another look at the markings just below the nape of her neck. The path he had just traced in the sky. Three stars, when connected, they created a straight line on a dawn horizon to... Dare he think it? Dry land? He now traced over points of the tattoo... But what had matched up in his mind fell short in practice. He shook his head. Now she was drawing an ancient beast which Gregor recognized. The beast had been called horses. Do you know what it is, child? She shrugged no. Do you remember it, or did someone show you a... I don't know. A side door opened, and Helen crossed the room. She whispered to Gregor, We've got to get out of here. I take it the meeting did not go there. They're putting us adrift, Gregor. They wouldn't dare cast me out, Gregor said indignantly. I'd shut down their power so fast. Not you, she whispered. Enola and me. They won't hurt you, he assured her. She cast her eyes toward the odd metal throne and its incongruous smokestack. How long till we leave? Another week, he said. We don't have a week, she said. We'll be lucky to have tonight. You know better than I that we could take off any time. But Helen, I don't know where we go yet. They looked toward Enola. The riddle needled onto her back remained unsolved for all Gregor's elaborate calculations. I know the child bears the answer. We seek if I could just solve the puzzle on her back. He shook his head. I just don't know how. Maybe, the child said. He does. The girl was leaning forward, looking out the window. End of Side One And so there you have it. That is part one of the Waterworld audiobook. We began with the Mariner salvaging the seabed for sunken treasures of the ancients and ended with the Mariner in a cage and Enola, Gregor, and Helen hoping he knows the way to dry land. Join me in part two where the story continues. But before you go, remember to give this video a like and subscribe to the channel to continue along with the rest of the audiobook series. Also, feel free to follow the Atoll on Instagram for more Waterworld content, link in the description below. And so with that, thanks, as always, for joining me at the Atoll.